Hey everyone, Mike here. It's called the Kessler syndrome. It's not a disease, but it has the potential to blanket the Earth with the destructive storm of debris. SpaceX is launching the largest constellation of satellites in history. And a lot of people are worried, very worried, about those satellites colliding and filling low Earth orbit with deadly projectiles, potentially blocking humanity's access to space for years. For American commercial satellites like Starlink, it's the FCC that has authority over orbital debris. It feels like forever ago that SpaceX first applied to the FCC for authority to deploy their Starlink constellation, over 4,400 satellites. In fact, they were only granted authority in March of 2018, around three and a half years ago. The Starlink constellation is designed to provide high bandwidth, low latency internet to any place on the planet, a pretty ambitious goal. To deploy that many satellites, the largest constellation in history, SpaceX has pulled together some pretty novel techniques to reduce the cost of each satellite and to increase launch efficiency by sending as many as 60 satellites to orbit with every launch. With so many satellites, with so much new technology, failures are bound to happen. In typical SpaceX fashion, they've been iterating on their original designs ever since enhancing the satellites themselves, as well as changing how they're deployed. The biggest change they've made to the constellation from their original plans is the altitude of the satellites. Originally, they designed the constellation to orbit at around 1,100 kilometers. Since then, they've applied to the FCC first to lower just the first shell down to around half that altitude, around 5,500 kilometers. And then later in April of 2020, to lower the rest of the satellites in the constellation to a similar altitude. Now, most applications to do any communication services from space generate a lot of opposition from competitors. But this last modification, lowering the rest of the constellation, kicked off a shitstorm unlike anything I've seen. Over 200 pleadings with companies like Viasat, SES, Kepler, and Kuiper from Amazon submitting pleadings to deny. The Balance Group, Spire Global, OneWeb, AT&T, Iris Access, Dish, Astroscale, all filing letters to object to some aspect of the change. And one of the common complaints was around orbital debris. SpaceX's early Starlink launches had a fair number of failed satellites. And with a constellation that big, even a small percentage of failures can be a lot of satellites. Now, Spoiler alert, the application was granted. SpaceX has the authority to deploy all their satellites at the lower orbits. They've already sent up some of Shell 3 from Vandenberg. But the FCC put some conditions on the authorization. And one of the conditions is that SpaceX has to send the FCC a report twice each year detailing all the Starlink satellite failures and what they're doing about them. Because they're concerned. If a satellite fails and can't maneuver, it's just a projectile orbiting around. And if two satellites collide, they smash into pieces. And then those pieces are projectiles that can hit more satellites, making more projectiles, until the process reaches a runaway point where there is so much debris that all satellites at that altitude are at serious risk. This runaway effect, referred to as the Kessler syndrome, was named for Donald Kessler, the NASA scientist who proposed it back in 1978. And it's scary because once it takes off, we don't currently have any way to stop it. So we've got the first failure report from SpaceX, plus some answers to follow-up questions by the FCC that's given us a ton of insight into the constellation that we normally wouldn't get from other operators. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, click subscribe down below and hit that bell icon so you get notified of my videos as soon as they come out. So we have details on 44 of these satellites that have had some kind of failure. Now, of those 44, 13 of them have already re-entered Earth's atmosphere and burned up. And really, this is the ideal case for any satellite that's not working. Once it burns up, there's no longer risk to any other satellites. 27 more of them haven't re-entered the atmosphere yet, but they are fully controllable and fully maneuverable. Probably this means that there was some other problem that SpaceX was able to identify, 
like maybe something was wrong with the communications equipment or the antennas. So everything to do with propulsion and control was good, but they couldn't use them for Starlink. Probably all of these satellites are being actively deorbited now as we speak. That gets rid of them while they're still under control and removes the risk that they might become unresponsive in the future. Now for the final four, there were three different problems. On Starlink 1847 and 1881, SpaceX describes the problem as a propulsion tank issue, which appears to be related to tolerances around the sealing gland. Starlink 1155 experienced a propulsion anomaly. In this case, SpaceX was able to work around the problem by reducing the duty cycle of the avionics from 100% to 6%, effectively turning it off most of the time. Now, they didn't go into specifics of what the problem was, but it could have been due to overheating of some components where turning it off more often would allow things to run cooler. And the last one, Starlink 1939, had a solar array failure and lost all power. So that one was completely unable to maneuver. Two of these, uh, they list as having the ability to maneuver with attitude control only. I was curious about this, and so was the FCC. When asked for more detail, I thought their explanation was interesting. The first technique is just a matter of turning or orienting the satellite so that it minimizes its cross-section to the encounter. So if there's a piece of debris coming, it can turn sideways or orient head-on to make a smaller target. They call this maneuver ducking. Then the other way they maneuver is by turning the satellite to control atmospheric drag. If staying fast will minimize collision risk, they can turn the satellite to present that knife edge, so there's not much drag. If slow is better, they can turn it the other way, which SpaceX calls a barn door, to maximize drag and slow down more quickly. So not nearly as good as actual propulsion, but still pretty neat. Now, with all the objections raised to their FCC application, I think it's ironic that all this focus on orbital debris came as part of this modification. By lowering the operating altitude of their satellite, SpaceX is making the biggest contribution to debris mitigation, reducing the time the satellites would take to deorbit all on their own. That one satellite that they've completely lost touch with, it'll deorbit and burn up all on its own within five years. At higher orbits, that could take decades. By lowering the orbit of everything, they've significantly reduced the long-term risk of disruption to our space access. I have to say, all this talk about satellites and maneuvering has me really wanting to learn more about satellites. If you're interested in more videos on small satellites and how they work, let me know in the comments. Maybe we can send up our own satellite together. Let me know with the like button down below. The European Space Agency did a video earlier this year called Time to Act. I've linked it in the description below, and I've included a couple clips in this video. If you're interested, I encourage you to check it out. It goes into a lot of detail around the history of how we've been managing space debris up until now. Thank you so much for watching, and keep watching this space. See you next time.